Vincent Herring, how you doing, buddy? This is my friend and the great alto saxophone player, Vincent Herring, everyone. He doesn't even need an introduction. What's going on, Vince? Oh, I'm doing okay, man. Nothing much. Yeah, I, it's kind of uh, intense in the United States right now, huh? It's nuts. <laughs> yeah. You know. All right. We're all doing the best we can. I, I want to be able to be able to travel again you know right i mean you know basically we don't we don't feel it all the things that are going on but of course we watch watch uh, media and follow it on the internet so we know what's going on and uh it's just it's insane right yeah. right well i just want to make sure you can hear me all right you can hear me good over there i can hear you fine sounds great well, uh, you actually probably don't need any introduction to anyone. I, I, I find you to be one of the most dynamic alto saxophones that have come, come, come on after Cannonball and Phil Woods, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I was going to say that the big thing that always sticks in my mind is when a Charlie Stevens, the great Charles Stevens, uh, rest in peace, from the Lionel Hampton Orchestra, years ago, when I first heard you play, I think it was a recording I had or something, and I mentioned you to, to Charles. I don't think I even knew you played in the Lionel Hampton band. I'm not even sure. And he said, oh, Vincent Herring. Yes, he's wonderful. He's a stylist now. And, and that was a heavy <laughs> thing. <laughs> that was a heavy thing for Charles to say. And I actually knew exactly what he meant. And it's become very profound because w when you play, I recognize you're playing immediately. So just uh, why don't we start with Lionel Hampton and you just tell me whatever you want to talk about, man. Oh, um, well, I guess, you know, I was playing on the streets in New York and, you know, I knew that was something I couldn't do forever. And there was going to be an audition for the Lionel Hampton Big Band. And uh, I decided to go to the audition and got offered the, uh, the job, which as a, you know, young kid, well, however old I was, 22 or something, maybe younger. Um, it was an opportunity to travel around the world uh, and experience what it was like to play music and, you know, earn money, not much money, but uh, have that experience. And so uh, it was kind of bittersweet. A couple of the highlights and a couple of the lowlights. I'll start with the lowlights. We would, um, f we would, you know, fly to some place like Oklahoma City get on a bus and you'd be on that bus for the next 30 40 days and every single day it's like i didn't even know the united states had this much land and you'd be driving for hours uh one highlight uh in particular i remember driving somewhere like new mexico or or oklahoma and and usually lionel hampton rode the bus with us and and put himself through the same thing but this particular time he flew to wherever we were going and you know we had a 12 15 hour bus ride whatever it was and we get there to the next location and he wants the rhythm section to rehearse because it's we, we have a concert with a high school band but they have a string section and the rhythm section is gonna gonna play with hamp and the strings so um, the piano player at the time, Rob Bagard, he's like, we should be getting extra money for this. <laughs> and we all started laughing. And uh, he's like, no, I'm serious. And, uh, and guys have been like, yeah, you should tell him. Tell him, Rob. And then he uh, goes to Bill Bergerac, uh, the, the road manager. We should be getting extra money for this. And Bill laughs. He said, yeah, we'll tell him. Um, and uh, he says, you should tell him. I said, okay, I'll tell him. So, so the next thing you know, I guess they had the rehearsal and we're all standing out by the bus, you know, getting ready to go back to the hotel or something. And, uh, and Hamp comes out and he runs right up to Rob Bagard. I mean, he's probably 90 or 85 years old. So when I say run, I mean, he has his fist balled up, comes right up to him, gets nose to nose. I should kick your ass. <laughs> and, <laughs> 
And we were like, let him hit you, Rob, because he's rich, you know. Let him hit you. He says, you ain't shit. If I don't play, ain't nobody coming. Ain't nobody coming to see your sad ass. And he just lit into him. And he, and he, and he did like this. And we were we were just rolling, man. We were cracking up. And um, and so uh, then Hamp went, turned around, went away. And, and, and so later we were playing cards in the hotel. And Rob's like, I'm going home. I'm going home. And we're like, Rob, man. How are you going home? How much money are you making? You know, it's like, you know, financially, we made so little money that going home would, would mean spending twice what you're making anyway. I mean, weekly, you know, like that kind of thing. So it was, it was pretty humorous. Played at the White House. I guess I was with Ronald Reagan and um, play, played a Christmas party at the White House and... Let me see. I think I made $85. You know, I was running late, so I had to drive to the parking garage where Hamp's apartment was in the 60s on the west side. And uh, I got there and I had to park in a parking lot in order to make it on time. And I did. And, you know, parking lot, even at that time, man, it was probably, you know, 40 bucks or something. So we drive down the bus play this Christmas party and then drive back. Hamp stayed overnight. And now here is the highlight. Um, in the party, they had these chefs from all over the world cooking, cooking at a station, like one station be Korean, next station be Jamaican. And, they, and these chefs, and they would cook preparing specialty foods and you just go around taking. And so first thing the road manager says, uh, no you guys are not allowed to go in that main uh, uh, hall room with all all the chefs. Of course, I'm like, shit, I'm making $85. Me and a couple of other people, we went right in there and had, had, had like, oh, man, the most incredible food ever, you know, giant shrimps and shit. And it was uh, pretty amazing. So, I mean, I had a, had a lot of uh, good times there. And then the one really good gig that Hamp had was... Uh, the Meridian Hotel in Paris, France. He had a club in the hotel that was named after him, the Lionel Hampton Room. Yeah, I played, I played there with him also, that Lionel Hampton Room. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and we played there uh, through New Year's. I forget the exact dates, but it was probably Christmas through New Year's. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was single rooms, which is a big deal, because when we traveled in the States, it was not single rooms. Um, and so it was, a, it was a decent gig. It was my first time going to, to Europe, period. And so it was especially nice for me. And, um, you know, I kind of summed that up as my Lionel Hampton experience. It was bittersweet, but overall, it was a great experience for me. You know, I met some really good musicians. Uh, right. I had some great times. Uh, just one more funny story. Uh, we used to do is play at Walt Disney Park in um, in California. That's right. I remember. And they, <laughs> and they, used, they used to have a um, what you call you know the park always had their electric parade. So we'd be playing, and the guy says you have to stop at you know four oh five on the dot, and the electric parade is going to pass through. And then you can resume at, you know, 440 or whatever it was, you know. And uh, yeah, okay, great. So the guy comes over, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. You know, we're playing, starting a new song, five minutes, five minutes. You can see the electric parade coming. It's three minutes, three minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, Two minutes, one minute, right? Have yeah, just plan, and then we happen to end the song right at the, right at the thing. And Hamp turns around, looks at the band, and says, "One more once, boys." And we went right, right? and so the guys like, the electric parade. You're playing through the electric parade. He was like freaking out. Oh my God, it's turning red. And uh, so when it was over, you know, they had some words with. Uh, uh, the road manager and told him, you, got, you must stop, you must stop. 
So the next day, same thing. You know, you have to stop at 4.05. I'll count you down. Did the same thing. Ham, flying home, boys, right through the damn electric parade. I had no reason for doing this. It was just hilarious. And so it just became torturous. And this guy, poor guy, is turning red. And it's not like he can't do his job. And, and I'm sure he's catching heat somewhere else. And this went on like three or four days in a row um, before Hamp would finally stop. And I remember they turned off all the electricity. It didn't matter because we were horns and uh, drums and it didn't matter when they turned the electricity off. Hamp looked right at the guy. Hey, Baba Rebop. You know, it's just, it was hilarious. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I remember uh, good moments like that. And, and uh, it was all, 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 an, all an experience, you know. That, that's so classic, man, because it, it doesn't sound like much changed from when I joined the band somewhere around 1990. It sounds, it's, maybe we made a hair more money. But, uh you remember the Hollywood Bowl? Did you ever play the Hollywood Bowl with him? They would, they would, yes. they would, yeah, they would the, remember they would spin you around? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I've, I've played the Hollywood Bowl with other people also. So, you know, I've, I've had some events where uh, I think Mingus Big Band, um, we were playing and, uh, and, you know, stage starts turning. And at that time, Jeremy Pelt was kind of new in the band. Mm -hmm. And, I was always advocating for him to have some solos, and he got a solo right when we were playing some song. He just started, and the stage started turning around. <laughs> cool. Lionel, yeah. Hampton, Lionel Hampton's one of the three spinners on the wall there. You know that, right? They got a sign. Oh, there's got to be more than three. Yeah, but he's one of the three. They put three famous ones up <laughs> with oh, Lionel, yeah. and maybe, maybe, I don't remember who else, but every time we play there, man, he'd, he'd keep on going, you know, and we're spinning. Sure. Them. He sure would. He sure would. Um, yeah, so that happened with Hamp, but it also happened with the Mingus Big Band. And I played there a few other times, and I'm trying to think if we got spun, maybe not. Right. So, yeah, I get those experience also. So you were confirmed with one of the guys in the band told me. and You, you said that you were actually making more money playing on the street than you were with Lionel Hampton. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Um, yeah, some days we certainly, or some weeks we average more. But, you know, when you look at the wealth of experience that I gained, right. it was certainly a worthwhile, uh, you know, certainly a worthwhile thing to do playing with Lionel Hampton. And, uh, yeah, we probably did, probably did net more money <laughs> come think of it yeah actually we did <laughs> but, but i agree playing with lionel hampton was the joy of my life and that was also the first time i took a trip to york to sweden uh -huh. and, the, and the very first gig was nina simone was the guest artist on wow that's on nice New Year's Eve. yeah so uh, honestly and the band's still going on as you know i'm still involved with the latest jason marcellus is in front and they're actually giving hamper uh, uh, i don't know if you heard a uh, uh, lifetime achievement award at the grammys this year no, I didn't. Yeah. He never received a, a a Grammy. Did you know that? No. And so they're finally no. giving him not that. Surprise. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised either. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, honestly, to tell you the truth, I learned so much from those casts. I'm still learning today, man. But, uh, but that, that, that was a great man, a lot of fun time. Man. Yeah. Who was in the saxophone section when you were there? It was uh that was after the famous strike. You remember the strike? You remember when the, the, the cats walked out at the airport? Did you hear about that? Going to Japan? That's right. That's right. So after the strike, they hired a bunch of uh, young cats, let's say. So it, it was a uh, Mark Rose, Cleve Guyton, Lance Bryant, and Andreas Bjorski on saxophones, Charles Stevens, uh, uh, Steve Armour on trombones, probably, probably some of the cats you know. I think Billy Johnson might have been playing bass, and uh, oh. and uh, Wally Gator is on drums. He's also passed away, too. But, uh, uh, when I first started the band, it was... Um... Tom, uh, Tom, he died of cancer. Uh, I, keep, I lose his name right at the moment, but uh, he was a good, good player. And, Tom uh, Chapin. Tom Chapin. Yeah, that's right, Tom Chapin. And uh, but for the most part, it was me, 
Keith Fidmont. Keith Fidmont was playing in the other alto. Uh, Jerry Weldon. Um, uh, guy with a silver cell. He used to play a silver selmer. Uh, was that Doug Miller? Doug Miller, yeah. And Doug's a really good writer, man. Right, crank out some good charts. And Dave Schumacher. So Dave. for the most part, that was the saxophone section. And uh, some really good players, man. And um, and I really enjoyed it. A funny, funny moment with Hamp uh, at the Meridian. He's going through the line. Everybody's gonna got to scat a solo mm. on rhythm. It's, it's like, oh, I can't sing. You know, so he starts with the trombone section, going one at a time. Medium rhythm changes. You got to scat a solo. The next trombone is good. Don't go on like that. And Keith Fitmont sitting next to me, he's like, this is some Uncle Tom bullshit. I am not doing this. And he was complaining the whole time. And so now he comes to the saxophone section. And he's starting the saxophone section. Um, I guess I guess over here was uh, Barrett. No, this would be ten, uh, tenor, Keith, myself, tenor, baritone. So he starts the tenor player here. Yeah, I'm pretty sad. He gets to Keith. Keith is like, sounds like George Benson. <laughs> He's like, unbelievable. And then it goes to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, what am I supposed to do? And uh, come to find out that um, Keith has a couple sisters. One was with Stevie Wonder. The other one was with, you know, some other mega uh, pop star or something. And they all, they can all sing, including Keith. And Keith, Keith sounded really great. And uh, it was I, it was just one of those moments that uh, always stuck out to me. And then another time, uh, actually, might have been on that same tour, Hamp uh, got, uh, he was, you know, taking some kind of pills or something. Whatever they were, they were falling out of his pocket onto the stage, you know. And um, guys were like, oh, it's Perkadan. I don't even know what Perkadan is to this day. But uh, supposedly that's what they said he had. And anyway, it was rare occasion. He, Because normally he just plays and plays, but he just like nodded out. And so because he nodded out and, you know, Doug's middle like, Gates, what you want to play? And he's just like, there, right? He's standing up over the vibe and he's not moving. So guys who never got solos, everybody was just jumping up, playing all out and stuff. It was crazy. And it went on forever. Whatever the tune was, you know, F blues or something. Uh, and everybody was playing these long ass solos. And then out of the clear blue hand, goes, hey, my Mariba. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 was... I hate to say it, but that, that sounds so similar to my experience in the 90s with the band. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, I was in the band in Paris when Lionel Hampton had that big stroke. You remember the big stroke that really no. damaged? No. Yeah, it was, it, maybe it was 92, 93. I, it was kind of sad because I, I just got in the band in 1990. And like you, I was riding the bus around Europe. And, you know, people don't know it's like eight, 12 hours on the bus and stuff like that. But, but it was a lot of fun, man. And Charles Stevens became my, my, my walking buddy and kind of my mentor to help me kind of get my just get my life together. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, he, he had a lot of arthritis and pain. Remember how he used to jump up on the drums and jump into the crowd and do all sorts of crazy stuff. And he injured, injured his body pretty good. So he was on Percodan for, for pain and stuff like that. And he did have a pocket full of, I still don't know what Percodan is. <laughs> it's, it's oxycodone, like Percocet, oh. Percodan, Percocet, but the, one of the original ones was Percodan then uh, Percocet became more popular. Uh, yeah. So he, he, there were a couple times he he towards the towards the last years he would nod off on stage or something happened like that man or, or you remember you remember the can of Coca Cola did he have the can of Coca Cola back in your day? No. He used to Not put 
He used to ask for Bill Burr's record. Bill, 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 bring me a Coke, huh? <laughs> so Bill put this Coke cola up on, on the vibe during rehearsal. And we're like counting down to when it's going to get you get knocked off. <laughs> so, you know, sure enough, you know, boom, <laughs> Coke, Coke go flying on the stage. But man, there's, there's only one Lionel Hampton, man. So look at yeah. <laughs> and it, it was wonderful for all of us. I saw some videos with you when it, you were playing lead alto. What I, I remember noticing was a teaching moment for me was you, you played the vibe of the band. You know, how do I explain it? You, you were playing the blues and you played in the idiom of the music at the time. Well, if you say so. <laughs> I, I remember um, it, you know. Maybe that was all I could do at the time. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> it's kind of good because I saw Freddie Hubbard do the same thing. You remember Freddie sat sat in at the Hollywood Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought Freddie was going to get up and do it as bebop thing, but he's playing over Hamps Boogie Woogie, and Freddie goes old school with the more linear blues the whole time, you know, to fit in, to fit in with the, the swing style. Yeah, well, I didn't. Uh, I guess it could have happened, but. Uh... Well, you, you. Sound, you sounded great, man. Schumacher and Weldon were playing, and Doug Miller went on to play with Count Basie for. Sure you know, did. Count Basie, you know. So. Yeah. Uh, Doug Miller still could write some good charts quickly. Quickly. Quickly, wow. like if you needed a chart, he write it on the bus. Get out of here. Yeah. That's like Frank Foster. Write it on the bus. That's good. And be a nice sax soli and everything else in it. Yeah, Doug, Doug's got a special talent for it. I mean, he wrote, I think he I think he had some charts in the Basie band as well. Yes, he did. He also, they're still playing Hamp, uh, the, the chart that uh, Doug Miller wrote, I think. Not not Hamp, uh, I can't think of the title. But we're still playing a chart Doug Miller wrote, a couple of them mm -hmm. for Hamp bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doug's back at Anyway, brother. Was it Cedar Walton next, or what happened next in, 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 uh, for you? Cedar's where I wanted to go. But, uh... Oh, um, next was um, probably Horace Silver. I mean, there were gigs in between, of course. Right. And um, like I used to work with David Murray, had an octet and a big band. I used to do that. And, you know, I was still really developing as a player. And I had some moments that were okay. And Horace Silver happened to hear me in one of those moments. He walked into the Jazz Cultural Theater and I was playing a blues in, in C. And afterwards he came up to me, man, you sure sound good, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, I said man, you sure know how to play. If you, if you play tenor, I hire you for my band. <laughs> like, well, I do play tenor. I'm just sitting in on the alto. What? Give me your name and number. <laughs> Gave it to him, and sure enough, he called me for a gig. <laughs> now the problem is I don't play tenor. <laughs> so I call up um, uh, Bramford Marcellus and get a tenor. I get a mouthpiece from uh, Ralph Moore, and I'm practicing this shit every day. It is just terrible. Just terrible, just sounds awful. I call up Ralph, man, what kind of sad mouthpiece did you give me? He's like, man, that was, that was my main backup. I like that mouthpiece better than the one I'm playing. Bring my shit back. I said, no, you gotta check it out. Something wrong with it. I bring it over, he plays it. Fucking sounds great. I was like, all right, maybe I'll try it again. You know, it's like, I had a real hard time. Then um, Don Braden got the job with Wynton Marcellus and went and bought Don a new saxophone. So I gave Branford his horn back and bought Don Braden's horn. And I practiced and practiced, still sound terrible, but, but I knew I had to play it. So get there to Horace Silver's house to rehearse. Actually, we, we rehearsed uh, at Billy Higgins uh, world stage, which was another part of town. Horace, uh, Horace lived in Malibu, and I'm not quite sure of the part of town that Billy Higgins, Billy Higgins uh, venue was at, but that's where we rehearsed. And of course I was terrible. I 
Horace was like shocked, <laughs> shocked. And so, uh, but at that time, I don't know, all, all the tours, everything was all booked. And um, now, if I remember correctly, with the Lionel Hampton Big Band, I think we made $450 a week, somewhere around there. Now, with Horace Silver, it was $700. $721.21 because we took taxes out. So it might have been $850 minus taxes. And $721.21. And uh, it was just incredible man, how sad the money was. But of course, you know, for me, it was a learning experience. I couldn't really play anyway. And uh, years later, someone started posting videos on YouTube, but they only would post Dave Douglas solos. So you'd see the whole band, and then Dave Douglas would take a solo, then the video would end. I was like, thank you, Jesus. And uh, and I was like, like that for a minute. And then, oh, uh, whoever was doing it started releasing the whole thing. Like, oh, it was terrible. And, um, you know, so that was that was pretty early in my career. It was certainly a gig that, uh, that I, didn't deserve at that time, you know, but, but, uh, you know, I was developing. Uh, so the next job to happen after that um, was Nat Adderley. And again, it was a situation where, you know, I was getting it together certainly better than the year before. And I sat in with Nat and we just hit it off on a personal level, uh, really really special and I really enjoyed talking to him every day and vice versa and we, man, we just talked about everything music was just one of the things that we talked about and it kind of rejuvenated him also I didn't know it at the time and and we had a great time together so the but Sonny Fortune was in the band but the first time Sonny couldn't make a job Nat called me for a job and and, and it was in Florida. So instead of just coming down and doing the job and going back home, I came down and did the job and stayed for a week. Mm -hmm. You know, and we just talked and ate and had fun, a great time. Asked him a million pesky questions about Cannonball. Uh, in Nat's house, he had um, Cannonball's saxophone behind glass. Wow. And, uh, and and he, of course, the case was, was out, out in the room or in the garage. And um, that was the horn that Cannonball was playing when he when he when he died, right? And so I could see it and everything. We just couldn't touch it. It was like, oh man, this is cold blood. I could see this in New York Meyer. And then I looked in the case, and it was um, Lavaz medium reeds and Rico two and a half reeds, and. Uh, and you know, it was it was inspirational to be able to see that. And at that time, uh, Nat gave me all of these videos. There was a guy named David Shertock that had all the jazz videos, and and he and he had given Nat a collection of everything he had on Nat and Cannonball, mm -hmm. and Nat shared that with me. So everybody knew I had this. So guys would call me up all the time. Hey man. <laughs> I heard you got these cannonball videos. Uh, is it possible I can? I'd be like, well, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, these things are pretty special. You know, it, it was like really pretty funny. And but I, I end up sharing them with some people. This is obviously long before the internet or anything of that nature. Um, my relationship with Nat grew, and even though I wasn't the you know best player around, you know, I certainly had promise. And Nat would show me. Uh, a box with people that mailed him tapes all the time, all the time. And, and you know, some of them like really sound like Cannonball. And he said, you know why I like you? I said, why? He says, because you don't try to sound like Cannonball, and, but you have the same spirit and the same feeling. 
I said, well, actually, I was trying to sound like Hannibal, but if you say that, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so it was it was kind of funny. Um, how, old, but, how old were you then, man? I hate to interrupt you. How, I'm trying to figure how old you were. Hmm. I guess maybe like uh, 20... Uh, well, what year would that be? Okay, probably 22, 22, 23, somewhere around. Are you and I the same age? Well, how old are you? I'm born in 1959, so I'm 61 now. Woo! No, no, you're older than me. Oh, damn. Uh, 60. <laughs> I was born in 64. Oh. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm messing my time up a little bit. In fact, I know I am. Uh, the first gig I, gig I did with Nat was really early, before Horus Silver. And the only reason it came to me just now, I remember with Horus playing the, uh, uh, some jazz festival in Switzerland, and they had a, a jam session later. And the jam session was Nat Adderley, Horus Silver, and some other people, maybe Johnny Griffin. And of course, I went there, and that's like, what are you doing here? Because I'm here with Horace Silver, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, come on up and play. And that's where I met Cedar Walton. And we played Green Dolphin Street. And, I, and Cedar asked me for my number, and I gave it to him. And sure enough, he called me for a gig a week at the Village Vanguard uh, with Billy Higgins and Buster Williams. And at the end of the week, Cedar said to me, well, man, uh, uh, young Herring, uh, you, you're very promising, but you're not quite ready yet. He said, I'll call you again one day. That was it. I was like depressed, fired by Cedar Walton, you know. He didn't fire me, but he just he just told me I wasn't ready. And, um, and so, you know, I was always, you know, I knew that the... Uh, the depth of musicianship of these guys was was really special, and at that time I was uh, I started studying with Phil Woods, and um, you know it was really we spent a lot of time on playing changes. Uh, not that he, not that I said to him I want to work on this, or you know it's just that's what we worked on, and I learned how to play changes better and hear things better and just uh, be more musical. And um, also just hearing Phil and realizing his depth of musicianship uh, was also helpful. And so next thing you know, my playing got better. What, what and, I'd like to ask what specific, I studied a, a little bit with a student of Phil Woods who, who gave me some, uh, an I was just young and I didn't know anything because I was a, a bio major at the time. But the things that he did teach me, I'm still practicing today. And then I, from Marty now, one of Phil's students, I got some other other information which filled in the sections of scales parts that he didn't talk about. But I'm curious specifically for some of the cats. For instance, for me, he just gave me a, a going to the minor nine, blah, 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 then a diminished scale, do, 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 and then the major chord. Then he had one I got later on Autumn Leaves. I'm I'm very interested for for you to talk about. Did he sit at the piano and play? Did he play things for you? How was his his method? I also just got his book. I've been reading that, which is fascinating. And uh, can you get into specifics of what it's like to sit and study with Phil Woods for us? Well, for me, um, for me, it was uh, you know I was a big fan of Phil Woods. So I think the first thing that we worked on was uh, thirds and sevenths moving through two five ones. Ba, ba, da, da, da. Like this, you know. And so um, those thirds through the sevenths, you know, helped you really to, to nail chords and, and progressions. And if there's one fault of my playing today, I'd say, I always land on thirds and sevens often. And, you know, when I'm there, duh, 
bam, bam. You know, it's like a, a, a constant um, a theme that happens uh, as I'm playing. I'm not even aware of it, but when I, when I listen to it, I say, wow. And of course, you know, the, the, the um, knell in the chords is very strong, but it's interesting uh, that that one little exercise um, had that much power that it's still prevalent in, in my playing today. Yeah. Um, lessons with Phil was a little bit different. Um, it was kind of all day lessons. And uh, so he would say, what? You don't know this? You can't do that. Oh, and he was like, man, work on this. And he would go. And uh, at that time, he chain smoke pot. And he would um, you know, watch the football game or something. I'd be in there practicing, and then he, he so maybe maybe the game was over. And he'd come back. All right, let's let's hear it. And then I play. He play piano, and then I play it. And he's like, "That's not bad, baby. That's not bad." Now, now uh, change it and do this. And then, oh, you can't do that. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ! And um, you know he would. It was. It was. Uh, I really enjoyed studying with Phil. You know, uh, um, he was uh, an amazing musician. And I think that today, you know, uh, people don't really, really know what a special musician he was. And when you listen to him talk about some of the older guys or, or other special musicians, um, it take, takes a lot of weight with me, you know, it, it gives a lot of weight with me because certain other people I knew, you know, like Clark Terry, you know, just, just, just freak of nature, great musician, really. And, um, and those guys were around, uh, it was different times, it was different times, but they were certainly around. So, so studying with Phil was great. Um, when I, I would say the most important thing that I learned from him is where the bar was ex where you were expected to be, to be a professional musician and, you know, what was really possible. You know, here was a guy that people assumed he um, was a bird worshiper, which he, you know, I guess he was, you know, but, but you know, he was in the Earl Bostic. <laughs> That's yeah, a little secret people don't don't really pick up on, and I and I didn't, and until right before he he passed, um, he asked me to come over, and I went over to his house, and he starts giving all me all all this stuff, and he gives me like these bricks of reeds. I'm like Phil, I got a reed into it. Take the fucking reeds. I'm like okay, took the reeds, and then he gave me these mixtapes, um, and he gave me some uh, tapes of like. Uh, like for instance, RCA, uh, he recorded a few records uh, on RCA images, you know, the great uh, recording. I think that one won a Grammy. Then after that, he won an, another Grammy for uh, Live at the Showboat. Two incredible records. So what happens after that? They record one more record. They don't release the record and drop the band. I was like, that's incredible. So he gave me a copy of that that record that they never released is called the seven deadly sins. Wow. And um, yeah, so it was nice to have that. I knew it existed. He gave me some other recordings that were not released. And um, then he gave me an Earl Bostic mixtape. I said, I didn't know you were in Earl Bostic. He said, what? He said, shit, you know, and then he started talking about Earl Bostic. And he, yeah, and then I started thinking about it, you know, all, you know, when he's always uh, gurgling that uh, uh, B flat to a G, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's Earl Bostic, all of that stuff. A lot of the tricks and things that he does on saxophone. And for people that don't know, Earl Bostic was an amazing saxophone player. Um, sometimes, uh, like if you ask somebody like Lou Donaldson, who, you know, Lou loved Charlie Parker, but he'll tell you, he said, said, Bird came one night sitting in with Earl Bostic, got his ass kicked. Um, you know, people are, you know, so distant from history that um, if you don't know 
you don't know. You know, of course, uh, bird with the intellect and the, uh, uh, the ability to um, you know, change the language in jazz is, is certainly a, a verified jazz innovator. But, you know, someone like Earl Bostick was uh, an amazing saxophone technician who and played it, great. Absolutely amazing. His altissimo was his stool. Oh. Day, um, his technique, his virtuosity. And I remember sitting beside Jackie Kelso in the Count Basie band. You know, Jackie Kelso came up during that period. He was, a, for those who don't know, was a great recording artist of the uh, what they call the Wrecking Crew, which uh, Carol Kay hates that name, so I shouldn't use that. But um, Jackie was a tremendous part of history, but he made some recordings where he, in the late 50s, where he basically was playing like Earl Bostic on the alto, you know, and, and that was a big influence for his studio career, for his, for his stuff. And I can't remember when I first heard of Errol Bostic, but yeah, it is just, just ridiculous. And then I was one of those young, young folks who was really enamored by Phil Woods, but I, I didn't go to music school and all that stuff. But I had heard Phil, I heard Mark Kirk in the Poconos while I was going to Lafayette. And Mark was a student of Phil. So I know Mark. Oh, okay. And, and some of the, my uh, band director there, knew I wanted to learn jazz and not really biology. So he got me a rental van and, and I was able to drive up for once a month and take some lessons with Mark. And that's where I first got some first Phil concepts. Then I went to see Phil Woods playing the Poconos when he had the, uh, you know, the no microphones acoustic band. And it just, it just knocked, knocked me out. You know what I'm saying? It was my 1978, 79. And I just remember Phil said to the audience, he said, I like the kind of music that makes you, move like this towards the band not the kind of music that makes you pull back because it's throwing so much at you i just remember he made that comment but I, i've always admired phil woods and I, I actually regret not studying with him and, and uh, i could see you get a little emotional talking about phil and i wondered if you had a chance to get his book yet yeah of course oh did you you, you finished it already you know it's funny i started reading it and uh uh, one of my tenants saw it and she begged to borrow the book and I haven't gotten it back from her. And uh, I was, I told her, I said, I have to read it because I had to uh, write something related to Phil Woods and I wanted to read the book, please, please. And so uh, I loaned it to someone. I have a nice hard back copy, but uh, I'll get it back soon and I'll finish reading it. I, you know, I know a lot of stories in there already. And, um, you know, uh, so I do have it and, but no, I have not completed it, but I will soon. So, so for me, you're, you're, I, I, I want to be sincere for all of the great players that Phil has taught, but to me, you're one of his greatest students, uh, and, and you're playing as a passion and an intensity which, which is, which is, is it's going to stand out in history as far as I'm concerned. I, I recognize your playing in basically a single note, you know, and, and then your drive and your um, accuracy and your excitement that you generate is just honestly overpowering. Um, how did, how long did you practice per day? Did you have a regiment? At different times in my life, I did. Um, you know, um, not as thorough as I could have been, you know, but, but certainly I try to always uh, put in quality time, right? Um, try to get a blend between playing and, um, and practice. It's, um, you know, so now I, I try to have a certain amount of time for flute and clarinet and saxophone, you know, um, and that's it. I remember Mark Kirk because I'd be over at Phil's house taking a lesson and Mark just came in and took Phil's clarinet. I was like, damn, who's this guy? That was the first time I met Mark. And uh, yeah, so. <laughs> he, kind of, he kind of disappeared off the scene, you know. Yeah, Phil told me he, he got in because I always asked about him. So he got into some kind of religious cult. Right. And um, kind of took him off the scene. But, but the things I learned at those five or six lessons, I still practice today. And, and, and some of it was just conceptual of how you're supposed to learn to hear and listen and play the piano, you know, play the chords. 
and, and, and learn how to hear through the changes. And it, it, it actually really helped me a tremendous amount. It, it wasn't until George Coleman, I got with George, who really showed me how to practice, to tell you the truth. You know, so. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, I'm um, in the process of uh, writing a book, and I've been there forever. But at this time, I'm 90% finished. Okay. So, um, it'll have some some interesting things uh um you know nothing like directly that i learned from phil but like regurgitated my version of of uh all of those things to help uh, create language and um so you know it'll uh hopefully um help some people and open up some eyes and ears and uh, the thing that that I appreciated about Phil was Phil always played with great logic. You know, he never just wiggled his fingers to just create excitement as, as I hear some people do now, you know, of course, and just no matter what happened and, and the intensity grew, uh, his intensity to match it or to elevate it was always based in, in some kind of logic, you know, you can hear and feel, um, feel it as he presented it and man it was just always just such a nice beautiful take on everything so i really really love this playing a lot you know certain time period like the period you were talking about even earlier i'd say like that golden period would be maybe maybe like 68 through 79 something like that you know that's a really special period. I mean, no, of course he played great all the way, but but that particular period was um, really special because it just his sound and his phrasing. It's interesting uh, just to hear him play a melody. Um, we did a cruise ship with Lewis Hayes and the Cannonball Legacy Band. And don't ask me how long ago, because these dates, they, uh, I lose the dates, but uh, Phil Woods, you know, was a guest on the um, cruise ship, so he played sets with different bands, right? He wasn't there with his band. And the night he played with us, um, you know, I was picking songs that, you know, that he'd have no problem with. So one of the things we did is this arrangement on what's this thing called love. So I said, yeah, Phil, uh, me and Jeremy would play this thing out front, and then you got the melody on what is this thing called love. And the way he played the melody, <laughs> was just incredible. I mean, it was incredible. And, and you know, I said that to Jeremy. He says, yeah, I have to agree. And, uh, you know, that was, that was special about him. Um, it was like when you listen to that Billy Joel solo, which is just, you know, off-the-cuff solo for Phil, um, he changed nothing about how he plays. He didn't try to become some pop saxophone player, nothing changed. Not his read, his mouthpiece, his phrasing, absolutely nothing. And that is one of the most gorgeous solos ever on a pop record. Oh, forget about it. And uh, I wrote out that solo years ago because in Connecticut, I was playing a lot of club dates, a lot of weddings, and I can't tell you how many times I played that solo. And it, it is beautiful. It's a beautiful, it's a perfectly constructed masterpiece. And when you write it down and play it, you really see the perfection of that solo. And I, I, understand, yeah. I understand it was two takes or something. something. Well, no, what happened, that was take number one. And Phil said, they were like, oh, like, you know, let's run another take. He's like, for fucking what? And they were like, oh, 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 like to have another take. And like, fuck, man. You know, uh, so I get, I guess there's another take somewhere. Right. Um, but um, no, that was, that was the first take. And it is, yeah. see, so, you know, here's his thing about, about what I'm saying is the way he caresses each note and he breathes life into that mm -hmm. the melodic content of, of everything. Um, I'll take another player. Um, we'll take Sonny Stitt, who's an amazing virtuoso and who I love dearly, you know, just as much, if not more, you know what I mean? 
love Sonny Stitt. Could you hear Sonny Stitt playing that solo? I couldn't. I could never hear that. Could you hear Charles McPherson playing that solo? No. It, it is a certain versatility in Phil's playing uh, that enabled him to do that. And it's just amazing. Um, so, you know, it was that kind. In fact, that was the first time I heard him play was, you know, riding in the car, going fishing or something. In fact, I think we were going fishing. And because we were in a very rural area in California, it wasn't a lot of stations. So we switched to AM and all of a sudden I heard that, heard that, that track and the saxophone. I was like, oh my God, who is that? What is that? I couldn't believe it. How great that sounded. And then I spent you know, the next days and weeks trying to figure out who it was. And uh, somehow, you know, I found out it was Billy Joel and um, and someone knew that it was Phil Woods. And I'm like, who was that? You know, and that was my introduction to, to Phil Woods. But I just, um, it's funny, I just love that solo so much. It was the first time I just heard someone drop down on a flat at five or I guess plus four now. Um, you know, I just never heard that I sound. I like calling it the flat at five, though, man. I, you know, because <laughs> coming from the slave period in the church, I always thought it wasn't in the church. The singers are dropping the fifth. I don't hear them raising the fourth. I hear that the church people dropping the fifth. How you feel about that, man? I, I, it's a uh, black thing, right? It was right when you get into the slave and the church. You like you bringing down the pitch. I don't feel people bringing up the pitch from the fourth. But that, that's just... Now you you know why we. You know, why some people use flat at five and others use plus four. Um, it has to do with the way we learn. Right. Um, back when uh, Bird and Diz and Cannonball and Architects of the Music were playing, uh, like let's say if they had a C7, uh, they would label flat at five for the sound that they wanted. And, and uh, you know, piano player played it, bam. That's it because you got C, E, and then G flat. And then B flat, all right. So that's flat at fifth. But then now players learn in terms of scales applied to chords. Scales applied to chords. So now if you got a Lydian dominant, one, two, three, four. So if the four doesn't exist, it's a raised four, F sharp, and then the G is still in there. So now it would be plus four. C7 plus four would be technically correct. And what I teach my students, I explain that to them. I said, um, so if you're um, ever playing with some older guys, they're gonna write C7 flat five. And yes, it's fucking correct. And they don't need you to tell them it's not. Um, it's, uh, it's a generational thing. So uh, um, that's all it is, it's a generational thing and, and technically, um uh correct today would be c7 plus four or sharp 11 uh for that reason it has to do with scales applied to the chords and uh in naming, naming those things. how would it relate to ma rainy singing though <laughs> that's all i'm saying i'm just trying to keep it on that that going back to the pentecostal church thing you know where the minister starts you know starts singing while they're while they're while they're while they're preaching Right, you know, uh, and, I tell and, you, you know, the music is so far from that now. It's um, uh, it's so different, man. Just the value system of what's what's good and what's special has really changed, and and you have to assume that that's because it's the music is being learned uh, in institutions. Primarily, the scene is in college, and um, so the whole apprenticeship thing is gone. The whole uh, learning music in the street, so to speak, that's gone. And uh, this is how guys are learning, and this is how guys are impressed with some stuff that I listen to, and I'm like, "What are you kidding? You know, that means absolutely nothing to me." Or I hear somebody and guys are like, oh man, this guy's incredible. And I hear him and I'm like, I guess he really thinks this is incredible. And you know, it's like I'm in a situation where if I don't like acknowledge 
um, if this is special, then I'm like the old guy who's just old and and just don't like stuff, you know. But if I'm being truthful to them, no, I don't like it at all. I'm not impressed with it. So it's um, it's interesting. Like I say, a, a different value system placed on it. You know, like I, I play some tracks on my record that I think are special. You know, I think, wow, this is great. This is pretty damn good. I like the way this came out. And, um, you know, and I know that it won't be received that way because it's not trendy. It's not trending with uh, kids with what they think is great. And what they think is great is different than when I grew up and I heard something that was great and I thought, man, this is this is special because um, we have a different value system. That's profound, man. And you're not the, I won't bring up any folks' names, you know, um, but you, that's not the first time I've heard that from elders like yourself who play on your level but your 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 uh, clarity in it is is excellent. The way you explained it, because some of them just they can't quite explain it. They're just like, man, no, you know, I, I'm just not a fan. I don't like that. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> it, it, it's I, I don't know what's going to happen. Jazz is very unpopular right now, and I think that's one of the reasons. I think we forgot about the people who are listening. You know, the people work hard all week and and. And they just want, they want some relaxation, they want some joy. Uh, the, the one reason the Count Basie band has survived so long, and I wanted, I wanted to talk to folks about when I, when I, I asked you to come play with the band was when, when, first one of the scariest moments of my life, because I know how strong you were, and I didn't even want to solo when you were there, man. You made me solo one night, and I was sorry that I did, because I was just so intimidated, because you like, you, as we used to say in Poquitos, man, you strong like bull. You know, <laughs> when you stood up, I was like, Roar! <laughs> well, I think, I think you played great, man. You were fine. I remember you played a really nice ballad. Beautiful. There's a ballad, lot of ballads for my thing. <laughs> oh, hey, that's 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 nothing to take lightly. I think there's a a lot of character and a lot of uh, talent in what you do, also. So I appreciate that, man. Mm -hmm. the, 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 but the, I was going to say the one the one thing that's kept the Count Basie Orchestra so popular is the joy it tries to bring to the audience. It can't and, the feeling, and the feeling, yeah. Yeah, this is true, but the value system is changing. You know, the popular, more popular band uh, with the kids would be Maria Schneider. And why? <laughs> why? And uh, so it's just, it's a very different value system. It's a, it's a value system that if you're going that if you study music in college and you listen for this and that, and this is executed this way, now that becomes special. So, you know, that's what happens. And, you know, in terms of the compound meter thing, in all fairness, I would say that uh, innovation is really um, in the compound meter. You know, if you think about Charlie Parker, who never, recorded and as far as I knew never played anything outside of four four so yes his rhythm was strong and he could play across the bar lines and do this and that all in four four you know so that's a very different thing and you have people today that can that are strong and play across the bar line in in multiple meters and, and never lose the beat and feel strong in it. So it's a different thing. And, and it, you know, Freddie Hubbard would say, get that Joe College shit out of here. You know, it's very, it, you know, it's very academic, but it becomes academic from my perspective to their perspective, it becomes normal. So it's, um, it's a different thing. That's their value system. Right. Hmm. That's interesting. All right, I, I wanted to ask you about Cedar Walton. Uh, okay. You schooled me one day on Cedar Walton because I was a little opinionated on his on his piano playing because I, I'm one of those people that, that listens for virtuosic, virtuoso kind of stuff. I had to go back home after you schooled me and listen at, more closely to Cedar Walton. And it was a learning experience for me, you know, because I, I was always listening for execution much of the time. 
but you know, that, that, what I enjoyed was execution. And then I began to hear what you had taught me to listen for in Cedar Walton's playing, his careful choice of notes, his unique way of phrasing. And uh, how do you feel about that in Cedar and his approach to the piano? Well, first of all, in terms of uh, virtuoso touch and stuff, you know, check out Cedar with uh, Art Blakey. Man, he just um, he plays great. And most piano players our age and your, your generation, they would consider Cedar is like the link between uh, today and uh, some of the older guys. Yeah. And uh, man, this is a guy who, uh, who, you know, played amazing music and wrote incredible music. His first teacher was his mother in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I actually met his mother. And, um, oh, I'm sorry about that. Excuse me. Let me just tell this person I'm a mother. So, um, yes, Cedar uh, was an amazing musician. I told you about the first time I worked with him what he said to me. And sure enough, he did call me again, maybe three years later. And by then I could actually play. And he asked me to make some jobs with him until he found, I'm doing an interview. I'm doing an interview. For uh, he asked me to make some jobs with him until he found a tenor player he liked. And I said, sure, right? And so uh, whatever the date job was, you know, I called him up and said, oh, yeah, you got any uh, music or anything? He says, um, yeah, yeah, we'll rehearse before, but uh, meet me at Sweet Basil's and I'll give you some of my music. I said, okay. Met him at Sweet Basil's, gave me a Cedar Walton, Jamie Ambersall record. Uh, he said, yeah, it's, it's mostly right in there. There's a couple errors, but, uh, you know, I was like, wow. So... I um, I went home and I started, um, you know, I'd already been listening to it because I really enjoyed the music, but I started transcribing quite some songs and learning quite some songs. So then I printed out all the songs that I, that I knew, Cedar Walton songs. So, and it was like everything that he had recorded, you know, for like the last 10 years or so, you know. And I handed him this sheet. I said, well, I learned these songs so we can play these. He was like, what? You know this one? I was like, yeah. And he said, and what about this one? I said, see, I learned all the stuff that's on there. You know, we might need a little rehearsal on the intros and exits, but but I got them all. Are you serious? I was like, yeah. So then it became a situation where that particular job, play any song he wanted, and bam, we did it. And... He didn't have to rehearse. So we never did rehearse for that first gig. And every time, you know, he would call me for a job, it would be just show up to the gig, man. And then we'd play some of those songs and occasional extra standard thr thrown in. But, but for the most part, exactly those songs that I learned, he still was playing those. So, so it was great for me. And then, uh, he never did find a tenor player that he liked, but he like said, well, why don't you play a little bit of tenor? I was like, oh man, come on. I had that experience from when I played with uh, with Horace Silver. So I, I started trying. And then um, when Ronnie Scott died, Cedar uh, got the family to, to loan me uh, Ronnie Scott's tenor. And so I had that tenor for years and I was playing that, and it was, you know, a nice uh, 84,000 Mark VI. So I was playing that, and it sounded pretty good, and I got used to it, and and I was getting a little better on the tenor, and so that was good from that perspective. Um, and then slowly, you know, it's like, ah, oh, play tenor on this, you know, so I was like, oh, shit. So then slowly became a 50-50 kind of, kind of thing, and. And I started trying to sound better on the tenor. 
And I remember one record uh, on my answering machine, I was playing flute. Yeah, you got a message, you leave your message. Yeah, just for fun. You know, I'd gotten the flute or something, it was practicing. So now we've got a record date, man. So seeds, are, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, 10 o'clock, man. Uh, yeah, get, pick me up and we'll ride over there. Oh, yeah, bring your flute. <laughs> I'm like, girl, call me, babe. Hey, what, what do you mean, bring flute? Yeah, I heard it on your ass machine. Sounds good. I'm like, I haven't been practicing. Click, you know. Fuck. So now, now I got to go to the studio and play a flute. I asked my uh, uh, wife at the time if I could borrow her flute, which she had a you know, much better flute than me, and I borrow it, and I'm like talking to a friend of mine, he's like, yeah, turn all the treble off, turn all the bass up, and your volume up, and and your reverb, and, and you'll sound like Hubert Law, so I was like, oh man, no, you know, but I tried it in the studio, and the headphones it actually sounded pretty good, so I get, so I get through that record date, and uh, played a co couple tracks on flute that actually sounded decent. And uh, and of course, he had me playing more and more tenor. And on his last record, um, I think I play all tenor and alto on one track. And so, you know, I had a great time playing with Seed. Uh, end up being 21 years, man. What's it that long? Hard to yeah. imagine. Hard to imagine. I had no idea. That's how long it was. A lot of folks don't know that the tenor and alto are a completely different voice. I, I started playing tenor in 1985, and a lot of people didn't even know I played alto anymore because I, I was basically playing almost tenor on everything. And mm -hmm. I, I focused on transcribing tenor saxophone solos, and it started with Nathan Davis at Pitt, who once told me this is a very difficult business now. And you really like bebop, but you're going to have to learn to make some money. So he gave me every horn, baritone, soprano, alto, tenor, flute, you know, it actually helped my career because I got some work, you know what I'm saying? So I, I really focused on tenor and, and um, it was kind of funny because my first sub in the Basie band was on tenor also. Frank Foster heard me playing tenor. And I agree with you. Tenor is a voice of its own, you know. Mm -hmm. I like the tenor. I would say I like the tenor as much as I like the alto, but not not playing it. <laughs> <laughs> you a true alto player, though, in my mind. Look, there's some folks who are not true alto players, and I don't know how to express that in the right way. But <laughs> you're, you're a, it, to me, you're an alto player. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say, you know. Well, thank you. I think I am also. You know, certainly yeah, that's where my voice feels most comfortable. Alto is a beast. Alto exposes you. You know what I'm saying? I see. I never had any issues with alto hmm. like that. Sound issues, nothing. I, I believe you can. People can fluff around a little more on the tenor and get away with the sound being closer to the male voice and get away with different nuances on a tenor out on alto. You know, uh, that's just my my feeling about it. Hmm. Look, brother, I, I could go on for another seven hours, but people don't want to listen for nine hours. <laughs> so we should, if, if you ever have any time, we should have another talk. I, you know, I, you know, you know. Just let me know, no problem. But is it true what Katz told me? Like, a, you know, I know a lot of your friends and buddies that at one point you were practicing like eight hours or more a day or something. something like that. But I think that's probably true for a lot of people. Right. I was doing it. Yeah, it was kind of... I thought that was exceptional. And then I found out that um, a lot of my friends were doing the same exact thing. And when I was working with Nat Adderley and we would speak, Nat would tell me how much Cannonball didn't practice. I was like, come on. Said, no, man, he just never practiced much. But he had freakish gifts. You know, if he ever heard a song on the radio, yeah, he knew it in every key. Didn't have to pick up the horn. <laughs> he just like... He heard Stella by Starlight, and he got it in every key. Wow. So he's just a freak musician, you know. And he said he, he just did not practice a lot. said the, the time he heard Cannonball practice the most is when he came back from New York. And um, Coltrane kind of scared him a little bit. And so uh, he said he practiced a little bit at that time. But before that, not much. 
um, I think it's an important thing to note. Uh, Cannonball and Nat uh, grad graduated college, I uh, forget the year, um, in the 50s. And uh, Nat was younger by three years. Uh, Nat was 1931 and Cannon is 1928, the year of their birth. And Nat told me he uh, got up in suit and tie and everything. And he uh, went into this office trying to apply for a job. And he said, may I help you, sir? And, uh, yeah, I'm here to apply for the job. And uh, she went in the back and told the guy. The guy comes out there and says, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm here to apply for the job. Nigga, get your ass out of here. I said Nat said that was his introduction to uh, applying for a job in Florida. And, uh, you know, we would have unique discussions. Like he would ask me about affirmative action if I was pro or con, but I don't want to get away from the story that I was beginning to tell you. So Matt actually went on the road first before Cannonball. And he went on the road with Lionel Hampton. <laughs> and he was traveling around with Lionel Hampton doing his thing. And, um, and they needed an alto player. They needed a second alto player. And they were coming through Florida and Cannon drove to wherever they were playing and sat in. And of course, we all know he sounded good. And, um, but Hamp wouldn't hire him. He said, nah, nah, if I hire two brothers and have to fire one of y'all, then the other one's gonna quit. Then I gotta replace two musicians. He didn't hire him. Hmm. So I just stayed in Florida doing his thing. And that was calling me, man, you, you should come up here. You're out playing all of these guys. And, um, uh, you know, he's, he said, uh, you know, the, the major voices was Jackie McLean and uh, Phil Woods and a couple other people, but Bird had just died. And, uh, and Cannon was like, nah, man, you know, I'm working all the time. I'm teaching school. Got a good school band, he said, uh, and then my band's working on the weekends all the time. You need to come back. And he said, make some of this money down here. And, um, you know, they used to have this conversation all the time. Well, Cannonball wanted to get a master's degree because it would pay him more money. And at that time, in the state of Florida, United States of America, you were not allowed to get an advanced degree. So the state of Florida, rather than, uh, or the black universities wasn't accredited uh, to, to give that. I don't know, maybe it was just music or I don't know if it was everything, but um, so he, but that they would pay for you to go out of state to uh, comply with uh, whatever um, rules and regulations the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act uh, demanded actually the Civil Rights Act came afterward, but whatever it was, they would pay for you to go out of state rather than have you uh, try to do that in the state of Florida. So Nat was already living in 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 New York. Cannonball came up for one reason only to enroll in school at NYU. That's the only reason he came to New York. That's it. And then of course he sits in. And, um, you know, basically, Nat and Cannon, they went, they sold Matt, uh, uh, our, our man, uh, uh, Jerome Richardson's playing in the village at this place, we should go hear him, because they knew Jerome, Jerome knew both of them. And um, so Cannonball is sitting on this case, you know, waiting to hear the band and everything. And Jerome is running late. And so guys somebody guys in the band say hey, man that dude right there he, he had a saxophone and um you know they were like a country dude that dude. you know we we we're top-notch musicians you know and uh and so when jerome richardson got there he said oh, man this guy can play so they invited him up and they decided to play um i remember april which at the time was was a tricky tricky song if you can imagine that is what nat said to me and he said, you know, being in the key of G, which was a little unusual, he said, but Cannon been playing that song down in Florida forever, <laughs> you know? So they decided they're gonna do the song really fast and Cannon jumped all on that song and they all went crazy, you know? 
that. And that told a great story, you know, about how it all happened. But, but that's the gist of it. But it just once again reminds me of uh, not teaching real history to the citizens of the United States. Um, you know, so much of our history is terrible, and that's okay. Teach the terrible history. Teach the truth about racism in this country. And, you know, that's a start. But don't keep suppressing this shit, teaching lies, and expect to build something on this foundation of lies. It's terrible. And we're paying the price for it right now. Um, so anyway, I just want to share that a little bit, something. So I appreciate that you did because in most of my interviews, I brought that up myself because that's been my family's experience of breaking barriers and telling the truth. And I thank you for saying that because I completely agree and, and people need to know the truth, you know, and, and uh, I don't know what else to say about it, you know. You know, we should end it on that very, very historic note, you know, bro. You know, I know it's late for you. It's just midday for me. I appreciate you taking the time, man. It's always a pleasure listening to you. And um, I'm, I'm still, I'm still working on trying to get that execution on the alto like the way you pop it out, man. So, you know. uh, <laughs> you I enjoyed it, man. Keep safe, man. And, and look, I, I hope I can get back soon, man. I was gonna come home for Christmas, but as you know, it just blew up. You know. So. Hopefully soon. Hopefully.